Oak Tree Capital Management. It's the world's largest distressed debt manager. And today I'm sitting down with the co-founder and co-chairman, Howard Marks, to find out about his journey to the top. I'm Jackie Britt, and this is Corner Office Confidential. A uh, definition of success is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. Opportunity is life. Well, thank you so much for having us in the Los Angeles offices of Oak Tree. It's my pleasure, Jack. What do you think is the biggest misconception people have about starting out on your own? What, pe what don't people anticipate? When we were a year old, everybody said to me, what has been the biggest surprise? By which they meant the biggest negative surprise. <laughs> and I said the biggest surprise for us was how much non-investment work there was to do. You know, everybody thinks as well. You open, you take offices, you get, you get some desks, you sit down, you start buying and selling investments. But there's payroll, personnel, insurance, tax, uh, IT is a huge thing, and and so many considerations that I mean. So and you can't do a good job of the work itself if you don't have a supportive infrastructure. Uh, so that that's a huge thing. Uh, now, of course, we you know we started off and within two years we were a ten billion dollar financial institution so we needed a lot of infrastructure the guy who's developing the, the next great widget in a garage uh, doesn't uh, but uh, for us that was the biggest the biggest surprise and you need a lot of people to do all those jobs and people management becomes important and so uh, you know whereas you might deceive yourself into thinking it's just this intellectual pursuit of, of profit you really have to do a, a, a steady job of blocking and tackling. I wanted to take you back to the university years, the very beginning. Uh, you attended Warden as an undergraduate and then you went on to the University of Chicago where you received your MBA. A lot of people have the debate whether to go back to school to get that formal education, that advanced degree, because they don't know whether the payoff is worth the cost of time and money. Looking back, would you say that that formal education, that advanced degree, prepared you specifically for an executive role, or would you have been able to pick up the tricks of the trade on the job? I, I think the main reasons to go back to school are to pivot a direction, make new contacts, and be exposed to new areas. If your career is going in the right direction and all you need is time, you get that on the job and expertise you can study you can learn you can have mentors you can take a professional education course if you need something specific if you need uh, to make a change if you need new science new technology then I think school is appropriate you have some theories on luck which I want you to elaborate on do you make your own luck do you think people are just born lucky what do you think well I think it, there seem to be some people who are born lucky uh, now, maybe it's because they're better prepared. You know, I think that success is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. Um, but certainly we look out and we see that's somebody who's, you know, consistently lucky. That's somebody who can't catch a break. I consider myself to have been systematically lucky. Um, but I do think that, you know, uh, when I first moved to L.A. back in 1980, I think it was, I heard Arm and Hammer uh, give a speech and he said, you know, if I, I find that if I work 14 hours a day, six, seven days a week, once in a while I get lucky. Um, so certainly hard work, uh, preparation, little things like IQ, being born in the right time, the right place, to the right parents who pushed you in the right directions, all these things contribute. Uh, but then um, I think that to, to really get to the top, you have to have luck also. And there are lots of people out there who are smart and well-intentioned and hard-working and willing and don't catch a break. So those of us who do get lucky, I think, should recognize it and thank their lucky stars. And, you know, Cicero, the ancient philosopher, said that the, the thankful heart is not only the greatest of all virtues, but it is the parent of all the other virtues. And if you don't have appreciation, you don't have anything. Speaking of mentors, you then graduated and headed to Citicorp, right. where you grew tremendously within that company. Yes. Were there people there, whether colleagues, supervisors, coworkers, and um, any kind of mentors there who really encouraged you to go forward, or was it purely self-motivated? I had a boss who was my boss to removed. We were a tandem, and we worked together in that relationship 
for about eight years. So number one, I learned a lot from him. And his success dragged me along, and maybe my success helped his. But then he stopped succeeding, and we actually reached a point where he was able to help himself politically by betraying me. How do you deal with someone going from mentor to an enemy? Well, he wasn't really an enemy. He just did me dirty. Uh, not in an ongoing way, but, uh, you know, things weren't going well for him or for me. We had lunch one day. He said, do you ever think about changing jobs? And I said, I would when everything gets calmed down and the organization is under control. And two hours later, I got a call from the big boss who said, I hear you want to change jobs. But the interesting thing is that that was the springboard for the best move of my life. That's the guy who said, I want you to start a convertible bond fund. I want you to start a high-yield bond fund. Uh, so that was really good luck, wasn't it? Um, and uh, and we, we, have to, we have to find our opportunities uh, where, where they exist. And those are words to live by. Yes. Back to your Citicorp years. So you were there for 16 years. Yes. And then you decide to leave for the trust company of the West, right. TCW. Yes. A lot of people being in that executive role at Citicorp wouldn't have rocked a boat there and moved to a new company. Why did you make that move? Well, I could give you the easy answer. Was my wife said, get out there and do it. Uh, but the truth is that I reached a level of uh, what we used to call at the bank uh, institutional constraint. Uh, you know, I was approached by TCW. They offered me a job uh, where I would share in the success monetarily. Uh, and uh, I went to the bank and I, and I said, well, what can you do? And they said, well, we'll give you an incentive deal, but not an exact percentage because we don't make exact percentage deals. And we don't make deals with individuals, but with teams. And, uh, and, uh, but we'll, you, know, you can share in your success up to a limit. Um, and we can't tell you what that limit is. Uh, and these are the kinds of constraints that characterize uh, what we call institutions, or perhaps bureaucracies. And um, eventually, if you're secure enough, able enough, uh, and, uh, and risk tolerant enough, I think you say, I'm going to try to escape those constraints. So you pushed the boundaries, so to speak, right. that were limiting you yes. at Citicorp. And you're at TCW for about 10 years yes. with it, all the while the seeds of Oak Tree are kind of sprouting. Mm -hmm. And you leave with five other partners to found Oak Tree right. 10 years later. How did you know that that was the right place, the right time, and the right move at that exact moment? I think, Jackie, the most important thing I can tell you is when you say the right time, that, that to me, that suggests the perfect time. There is no perfect time. And if there is, you can't know it. Uh, you know, one of the most important sayings is that perfect is the enemy of good. It was a good time. It might have been better if I'd left five years earlier, or better still if I'd left five years later, but I knew that that was a good enough time. Uh, we were doing extremely well for our clients. Uh, the, the six of us had a tight uh, uh, partnership, and, uh, and uh, it was a good time. Um, and, uh, you know, we felt secure. We had proved uh, by working for 10 years that we could produce good results for the clients, and we felt that if we could do that, uh, we would be successful. We didn't have a budget. We didn't have a plan. We didn't have even have that b famous... Uh, back of the envelope that they talk about in Silicon Valley, we were only secure in the knowledge that if we could continue doing a good job of investing, we'd have a successful business. You mentioned a good team, and you clearly surround yourself with good people at Oak Tree. How do you identify those characteristics that are critical for your team and the people you surround yourself with? Well, in this case, uh, of course, I had the good fortune of having worked with these people 10 years, so I knew at first, there, there's no substitute for first-hand knowledge. When you select people from an interview and a, and a resume, you know, you have about a 50, cent, 50 chance of getting it right. Uh, but it, it, when you've worked with somebody for 10 years, you, your odds go up. Uh, what we look here, for here is, number one, intelligence. You know, the, what we call in, in the business world the best athlete. We're looking for great athletes. We're looking for part, people who are really smart clever, quick, get it, see things maybe that others don't see. Not necessarily the highest IQ, uh, but uh, insight. But we're also looking for good people that you want to associate with. There are a lot of people who would help you make a lot of money, but you, they come under the heading of life's too short. Uh, and we try to avoid hiring them. 
and we want team players. We, you know, we don't reward individual success here very much, uh, rather team success. And we want people who like the idea. Some people say, I don't want to be paid on su team success. Uh, you know, I'm going to do a great job. I worry about everybody else. I just pay me. We don't want those people. We want people who want to contribute to the success of the team, work with others, and bet their success on their teammates. That, can, that makes people work together, cooperate, try to make each other better, uh, and that kind of thing, and that's what we want here. What about the cheerleaders, the people outside the workplace, your friends and family? How much do they impact your success in the workplace? Well, I think it's very important to, I mean, look, you, you, there are lots of ways to succeed, and there are lots of ways to fail. And people can have cheerleaders and fail or work, or work in an isolated fashion and succeed. But I think it's great to have the support of a, of a, of a loving family, uh, which I was fortunate to enjoy, great friends, um, and, uh, and, uh, and maybe educators or maybe the people you, you meet uh, who contribute to your life in, in, in a variety of ways. Um, I, I think that's important. Uh, Obviously, I think you can get the most done if your head's in a good place uh, and if, you're, if your world is a, is, is a happy one. Things that you don't anticipate are that things like your memos becoming so popular mm. Mm. and then writing a book, the most important thing. Right. What do you think is the best piece of advice that you've ever received? As to an, a specific piece of advice, my dad took me aside the first day I was going off to work at Citibank the first summer and he said, Treat everybody as your equal. Don't sir anybody. Don't mister anybody. We're all the same. And I've tried to, I always did that w uh, with my bosses, and that's the environment I try to create here, which is non-hierarchical, and I think that way we get the most out of everybody. That culture is so important. And finally, looking back on all the years that you've been in this industry, do you have any regrets or anything that you would do differently? Well, you know, we've bought thousands of securities over the years, and uh, we, 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 there are probably very few that we bought on exactly the right day and sold on exactly the right day. So tactically, uh, you know, there are always little things. But uh, I'm very satisfied. I think we've done, uh, we've treated people well. We've had shared success, and we've shared it with the people who contributed to it. Uh, we enjoy a great reputation with the clients because we handled ourselves with professionalism and integrity uh, and made some good investment decisions. Um, um, and I think the, on the investment side, I think we turn defensive at the right time generally and aggressive at the right time, uh, which is, uh, to my way of thinking, the most important thing. So I don't have any, any big regrets. Uh, you know, if we had done X, Y, and Z exactly right, we probably could have made a little more money, uh, but that's not the mark of success, in my opinion. Well, it's good to have no regrets. Thank you so much, Howard, for joining us. It's my pleasure, Jack. Yeah.